Because at the end of the day, the private equity industry sells themselves on past performance. And if that's not there, then they are in trouble. So past performance is the carte blanche for them to do whatever they want. And so if you defeat them on that, if you say this is not as clear as what you make it sound, they get very upset. And lots of people get very upset because their livelihood depends on that statistic. All right, everyone, I think this is the most important episode to date because we'll be talking about private equity, an industry that's becoming larger and more democratized with the greatest specialist of the topic, Ludovic Fadipu, a professor of financial economics at Oxford University side business school and a powerhouse in academic publishing with more than 10 papers on the topic that have been downloaded a hundred thousand times. And he's also the author of what I think is a must-read book for any investors who consider private equity laid bare, something that we're going to discuss. And if all these academic credentials uh, were worrying you, I would say it's a book that managed to go very deep in the mathematical and legal complexities of private equity, but remains entertaining to read. Yes, it's possible. Ludovic, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. So there was a really great uh, article on institutional investors about you, and they were saying you're the bête noire of private equity. So it, it said that you're very much their enemies. And we might be criticizing a bit the industry in this podcast. But before that, as it's the tradition here, I want to share a little clip. There's not that many movies about private equity. This one is Barbarians at the Gate. If Henry Kravis was CEO of any other company in the country except his own, they put him in a straitjacket. They take him away in a rubber limo. Henry Kravis pays out these incredible sums because his money is all junk bond crap. It's phony. He's phony. What did you think about that? Yeah, I, I think it's not quite accurate. I think it's very important to stay cold and sticking to facts. When people make movies, they tend to want to dramatize everything. But it may be also a disservice, especially if we come to education. So... There are some good aspects, less good aspects. There is lots of heterogeneity across firms, across type of deals, etc. And so it's very important to, in a subject that is that complicated, to have very good education about how it works and to have a very good view of the, uh, of, of, of the overall industry and differences between players. And there is an uh, ongoing massive amount of research on this because it's a topic where we are starting to get data and analyzing them, etc. So... We don't know everything yet, but over the last five years, actually, we've made a lot of progress on understanding uh, how employees and other stakeholders fare uh, in a typical leverage buyout. What's very interesting indeed is about you talk about nuance, complexity. But when I look, for example, at Blackstone's website, so the largest private equity firm, they've actually passed one trillion in asset under management. What's striking me is how much they simplify. They don't even talk about Blackstone funds in their education part, they talk about private equity. And from memory, they say 14% return, much higher, which shows much higher than uh, public equity and 10% volatility. So they simplify to the point where it's private equity and not Blackstone, uh, which is weird for Blackstone brochure. What's your take on that? I would think it's for legal reasons that if they put Blackstone, people could say, okay, this is actually commercial material for your funds and therefore you're trying like to fundraise. I'm, I'm sure there are some legal reasons around it, but you're right that intuitively it's very weird. Where it gets, to me, where, where it gets weirder in a similar example is like if you take a consultant like Hamilton Lane, Stepstone and others, and whenever they make a presentation on why private equity, they always tell you, oh, here is the average return. They look great. Here is the top quartile. It looks even better, etc." But you're like, yeah, but you're a consultant. So my key question is, how often do you get people above average and how often do you get people in top quartile? Of course, they say we get everything in top quartile, but that's because on paper, all the funds are top quartile. The key question is, on realization, how often have you got it right? And is this independently analyzed and so on? So that's indeed a bit surprising that people always just say, oh, here is the average return on the industry. It looks amazing. Here is a benchmark I chose quite strategically for public equity and it looks amazing. And then I can show you even to the top quartile guys and it's even better, of course, by definition. 
to talk more about education and what you're doing, can you give us an overview of what you're teaching at Oxford and also what are the objective of those people who learn about private equity? And I assume a lot of them go to work in private equity. Yeah, I have a large number of alumni in private equity and, and I've tried to get, especially women, to get to work in private equity. But a lot of them give up and it's quite an, a very high burn rate. So we get like young people to get into private equity and then they, they walk out. So some uh, persist, of course, some of them do spectacularly well. But basically in a nutshell, there is about 150 MBAs and MSCs that goes through my courses in private equity. There is 100 executive MBAs a year. I have an online executive program in private equity that has about 600 people going through it in a year. And I have some dedicated face-to-face, one-week uh, executive programs in private equity and, and related fields like valuation of private assets. In total, it's like 1,000 people a year that go through my courses. A quarter of them end up working in private equity or around. So working in private equity is not just like getting a job at KKR. We do have some alumni at KKR, but of course, out of 200 plus people a year that get into private equity, after my courses, these are not the only jobs they do. So they work for pension funds, they work for all kinds of service providers. There is a broad range of jobs in that industry. We're going to go a bit more into the details, but I have to say, as I am myself, I don't have the benefits of uh, studying your course directly, but I, before even reading the books, I thought I was a student of private equity. I've studied finance at HEC. I've done the Kaya, which is about alternative assets. There's so much that I've read through your book and following things on LinkedIn, which to me were the essential questions that we're missing from elsewhere. So one, one of those examples is the IRR. And we, I keep seeing quotes, private equity returns compared to public equity returns side by side. And like I mentioned in Blackstone, they, all, they always look much better. Can you tell us, first of all, what are the challenges with IRR and how we should look at those uh, returns? Yes, yeah, so IR is a very good illustration on how education by an academic may differ from education by a practitioner. Because private equity is so complicated, so complex as a topic, and there are so few people who used to do research in private equity, there are more now, that in most schools, these courses have been given to teach to practitioners or ex-practitioners. And even when it's not the case, academics typically bring a lot of practitioners and let the practitioners do the show, leave them the floor. And so they, they give their own soup, they give their own uh, version of everything. It would be like that in about any industry. You could imagine if Big Pharma was teaching all medical students, if Monsanto were teaching all future farmers, it would be not quite like as if it's a neutral person. But here it's particularly vivid. So the case of IR is, is a very good case. IR is a measure of performance that we know is flawed. It's not about any textbook. You open any corporate finance textbook, it's there, IR is not as good, you should use NPV. The problem is that these people wrote these textbooks on corporate finance, don't know private equity. And so the cases they, they cite about the problems with IR is like multiple solutions or things like that. But this is a detail that basically never happens in any sorts of uh, overs. In private equity, it is a very different setup. And the key is that you have what is called endogenous exit. So People can time when they want to exit an investment, which is something that the usual t- corporate finance textbooks do not think about. They say, oh, here's a project, you hold it for five years, this is your IR, there may be an intermediate cash flows, and then let's try to compare it to an alternative. In private equity, it's like, okay, there are 20 projects, you can strategically exit the one you want when you want it, and what happens then? And what happens then is that the flows of the IR that are like minimal in the typical case, you can play so that they are exacerbated. You play on the weaknesses of the IR and you just blow it. So IR is going to be very bad whenever there's going to be early, strong performance or cash flows, and you're going to to hold on to your losers. And so what happens then is that after a few years, IR typically will not move anymore because IR needs to make a, a reinvestment assumption which means that if you had strong early performance, all these dividends you have distributed are assumed to have been reinvested at a very high rate, which means you're sit- sitting nowadays on an assumed amount of money that is gigantic, which means that no matter what you do, your performance will not change. So let me take you uh, through a, a simple example, which is pretty typical. So the IR of Blackstone, for example, is much lower than the IR of, of KKR, yet Blackstone is much bigger, right? 
So um, why is that? Well, the KKR started in 1976. Blackstone started a lot later. When KKR started in 1976, their first few investments are pretty good. And that's pretty normal for about any private equity firm because when you start, either it goes well and you stay or it goes badly and you get out, right? So even if this was like pure randomness where people were staying in, in business, we'll have always at the beginning of a track record, a strong track record, strong cash flow, strong realizations. And the IR of KKR is 23% net of fees. Gross of fees is more than 30 or something like that. So 23% net of fees. It means that all the cash flows they got at the beginning of like the 1980s are assumed to have been reinvested all the way to today at 23% a year. So people don't have a good in intuition for compounding cash flows uh, or compounding returns, but you, I encourage people to go in Excel and just put in what just $1 million in 1980 growing at 23% a year net of fees would be worth today. And it's going to be like in the hundreds of billions. Of course, yeah. nobody who has just put 1 million in KKR in 1980 is sitting on 100 billion today. We know the people with more than 100 billion in wealth and none of them are KKR clients. So what that means is that the money that KKR made in the early 80s is supposedly worth 100 billion plus today. And KKR in any given year invests about 10 billion, 5 billion, things of that magnitude. And so if it goes well, that 5 billion becomes 10 billion. If things don't go so well, 5 billion stays 5 billion, something like that. But the difference of five plus minus 5 billion, in my example, is peanuts compared to the 100 billion plus that is always reinvested cash flows that supposedly worth so much money. Which means that every year when KKR publishes their IR, it's the same number. It's the same number because no matter what they do in a year, it won't change the fact that they are supposed to sit on so much money from reinvested investments, distributions. So that's a very good example where about all the private equity firms benefit from these inflated figures. Any old private equity firm has IR in the 30% plus. So if you have a practitioner coming to class, they are going to flash that number because they always flash this number and all the students are very impressed. And it would be pretty rare that a practitioner would say, oh, this is a measure that we all use in the industry, but be careful. It's like pretty crappy, like never changes from one year to the other. And there is a very easy way to game it. Like, why would you do that? It's your job. Like you do that, right? So that's not education then, right? Then it's like you can call it propaganda at worst and uh, a sales speech, a teach at, at, at best. And the problem is that most private equity education are sales pitches. And when you challenge a practitioner even on these sorts of things, they get very upset. I can give you an example where, so usually practitioners don't want to come to my class, like in, on the GP side, so many LPs come, and then most of the people who come are peripheral people. It's like lawyers or like people like that, but, but they, they don't, not directly like fund managers. That's pretty rare because they don't want to. And they have come sometimes and, and then they don't come back. So I give you an example of somebody who at one point I co-teach a course with like an ex-practitioner, friend of the industry. And so he gets for his contact. And also because the son of this person was on one of the MBA students, this person accepts to come to the class even though I'm there. This person is a founder of one of the largest private equity firm in the world, founding partner of one of the top five private equity firm in the world. During the presentation, we explained that they're all a bunch of geniuses because that's what you do. You come to a student and say, here's how private equity works. And I'm going to explain to you why we are just pure geniuses, right? On top of that, he might have insisted on this given that his son was in the audience. And it's either, it's probably a student who asked that question. And then it said like, oh, it's all good. You've been saying like how the industry on average does well and how you guys are geniuses and so on. But what is your performance? And then the guy just don't botch and he says, we have 30% return. A year. Return. Yeah, we send return a year. Warren Buffett is at 18, right? The S&P 500 is at 12. About any, on any time period in the US, you're about at 12 with public equity. You get Warren Buffett at 18. And these guys just casually grow up. Look, we're at 30%. And the student says gross of fees. And he says net of fees. Net of fees is 30% return. Wow. And I interject at that point and I say, I suppose this is an internal rates of return. And he says, yes, it is. He says, but... Our multiple of money is also extremely good. Okay, so that's a bit more interesting already. It's a bit harder to manipulate. So how much is your multiple of money? And he says two times. 
that's good. Yeah. It is not shocking, but it's good. And then I say, is it gross of fees or net of fees? Because you just cited a net of fees number. I'm just wondering if this, this multiple just cited is gross of fees. Oh, it's gross of fees. We always quote a multiple gross of fees. Okay. And what is it net of fees? I don't know. I don't have it in mind. I suppose about 1.6. Yeah, that, that would make sense. It's 1.6 net of fees. 1.6 net of fees on a four years holding period. So about 12, 13% annualized return, which is indeed, when you do the math correctly, the performance of an average fund in private equity. And you are being like one of the top five in the world. I suppose your track record is a bit above, probably around like 14% or so, which would coincide with a net multiple of about like 1.65, maybe 1.7. And these guys has refused to come back to the class because I made these two interjections, right? He has refused. So you would think it's first pretty innocent, pretty not to ask, and two, for the benefits of the students, it was probably quite important to make this remark and, and putting a bit more context and understanding around the numbers this guy was dropping, right? But then it, it doesn't come back. I have another okay. anecdote for you since you said you studied at Ashose. Many years ago, so it's all gone, but tell me. <laughs> I received an email like three years ago, something like that, by a master student at Ashuse who wanted to protest his grade in private equity. So he had failed the private equity course. And then he tells me one of the questions we had was, how does the performance of private equity compare to public equity? Answer A, it's not as good. Answer B, it depends on the benchmark and it could go like either way. Answer C, it is like orders of magnitudes above public equity. All right. And he chose answer B, saying that it depends. That would be my answer as well. So you're going to tell us now if it's true. And, right. and he got a zero, right? And his teacher was a practitioner, but the guy was just saying what any sales pitch say, which is like, very, wow. Like, of magnitudes, right? All above public equity. And then it is in the exam. And this guy yes. fails the exam and in particular fails that question. And then wants to rob me in the protest saying, you're a, a, a recognized academic in, in this, what would have been your answer to that question? And I would tell him answer would have been my answer. And then he says, yeah. And then like how unfair it is. So we have this practitioner who came in, gave us a sales pitch about the industry, etc., And then we get a formal exam And we have to repeat what the sales pitch was in order to pass the exam, otherwise we fail, right? We cannot have any critical thinking or anything like that. This is what happens if you just have sales reps teaching a course or uh, intervening in these courses without an interruption by teachers. I've seen even teachers at prestigious MBA programs inviting these practitioners, leaving them uninterrupted and posting on LinkedIn afterwards, etc., saying amazing that this guy from this big firm, this rich guy came in and told the students all about his genius and it's really fascinating to hear. As a teacher, you're not supposed to be fascinated to hear anything. You're supposed to be there to understand what's going on and when somebody tells you what's happening, to be able to criticize is putting in context, seeing that there are two ways to see the same reality. I had an amazing talk once, 30 minutes conversation with the CEO of Blackstone, extremely clever person who was not very happy with my article on the billionaire factory, where I take an example of Blackstone deal, which is the Hilton Hotel, which was the deal he was in charge of, and that's what made him famous and rich, and now the CEO of Blackstone. I had a very rich conversation with this person where he was extremely rational and, and reasonable. Whenever he was putting an argument, I was putting some counter argument saying, well, there's another way to see this. He would recognize some of it. Some of the time we, we left it and say it's open for interpretation. I, this is the way I would interpret it. I had a different interpretation. This was massively rich discussion. It was rational. And each time we could see that there was room for interpretation, we could see I could understand his, his point of view and he couldn't understand mine. And I really, and I invited him and I said, can you come to my class and we do the same discussion? It will be massively useful for students to have your angle because it is rational. It is making sense. I was genuinely impressed by that guy, but there's also like, like an interpretation on a few points. 
that I, I think would benefit students to hear. And this person has always refused. He said, no, I'm not going to show up in public with you. I'm going to show up in public and have that kind of conversation with you. Um, but we can see him in a very, uh, just to interject to say, we can see him in a very funny holiday video from Blackstone, which I'll reference <laughs> yeah, yeah. in this article because it's definitely worth it. Sorry, please go ahead. No, but so, so that's it. So I, I'm, I'm quite passionate about the importance of educating people right. Uh, and I pride myself that so many people are going to private equity after my calls. If I were an enemy of private equity and, and would tell people that this is all crap and this is all a bunch of gangsters, I probably wouldn't get any students in the industry. Tons of my students go there. I like to believe that they are better educated and they are better uh, people, but at least I think they have better information. And we do all kinds of like amazing things in these courses. We do role play where we discuss, like a, we negotiate a debt package between a bank or private credit and a general partner. Most of the course is actually pretty neutral vis-a-vis -vis of the industry. The industry would agree with like 90% of, of, of my course content. 90% uh, of what is in the, the textbook practically they bear. Where, but the problem is that their key selling point is where I put the biggest question marks and question, like this idea of like, you, you take a price at exit and a price at entry and the difference you call that value creation. There is no reason to call that value creation. The fact that you take an IR and you present it as a rate of return, it's extremely wrong. And people get very sentimental about this because at the end of the day, the private equity industry sells themselves on past performance and if that's not there, then they are in trouble. So past performance is a carte blanche for them to do whatever they want. And so if you defeat them on that, if you say this is not as clear as what you make it sound, they get very upset. And lots of people get very upset because their livelihood depends on that statistic. And the second thing is this idea of like value creation, etc. That is also something that helps them sell a lot. But the key stat is like a performance. If you tell them they are, perform well, they will forgive you anything. We can see it with colleagues who are researchers in private equity. They are very positive on performance. They have some papers critical of private equity, as critical as mine or more, and they don't get into trouble because they said it's fine. And on average, overall, they perform very well. Now, this is so interesting. So but basically, to recap, we, we started with Barbarians at the Gate, and we said it's unfair criticism. And by the way, the movie is called Barbarians at the Gate, but if you watch it, that... Indeed, the, the company needs to be restructured and the CEO is playing a role and using that's two jails. A terrible company. It was known that he had uh, several private jets. One of them was uh, just to fly the dog independently from his wife and other people. Exactly. exactly. So should, we shouldn't be fooled by the title. And also, it's not that not a basic assessment of the industry. But what you're telling me is that there's those fundamentals and performance is obviously the one that we start with, which are ambiguous or, or just presented in the wrong way to keep it simple. It's something we discussed as well with the previous guests we, we talked about, the myths of uh, private equity performance. But what you're telling me as well is that I was thinking that one of the issues is, for example, that, well, the education comes very much from the providers, through their website, etc. Everybody's now uh, jumping on that bandwagon, especially because it's a uh, democratized individual investors can also access it. But maybe they also have a lot of PR machines and that's why the press keeps going. But what you're telling me is even deeper, right? It's basically, where can we go to the basics in academia? But even in academia, it's all dominated by practitioners. And therefore, it's very hard to, to change that. So... Do you think, except for following your course, attending it, but it's a, new, it's a small number, it's a few thousand, reading your books, what, what do you think should be done about it? I think it's an academic problem. I, I think universities have to think a bit harder. I would think it's almost only private equity that is so much, so often given to practitioners to teach. And that's because it's seen as like a very complex topic. It's mm. complex, specialized. People feel that they, they, they don't have anyone in-house and they give it to a, to, to a practitioner. We don't see this in M&A. Even hedge funds are typically taught by academics. Mutual funds are certainly are. Asset management is, is, is taught by an academic. Imagine if you had like AQR being like the main provider of people to teach an asset management course. That would be very different music than academics. AQR is probably not the most extreme example, but like a hero price. No, no, but I see. So AQR is like the, the factor investing, so that they would come with this quantitative method and say, this is investing. There are more academics researching private equity. And so I think there are more academics that we start teaching course in private equity. But by and large, we see people mainly teaching case studies, mainly bringing in practitioners. 
uh, and again, most universities having practitioners to teach these courses. So my book and all the, the, my podcast and all these resources that I have produced were to try to change that. Uh, I didn't get that much traction. People still find it overwhelming and difficult to teach private equity. And it's so handy to have these practitioners who tell you these war stories and students are fascinated by them. And so then they get good ratings even. So then I, that's it. I don't know what to do about it. There will be a, a slight change due to the fact that more academics are doing research in that field and therefore can teach a course uh, on that field. The research from academia is increasingly more neutral. So it used to be only a few researchers that were doing private equity and they were very close to the industry. And so maybe we had a certain angle. We see that the younger people entering the field in academia have a different angle. They write differently, although they have to be conscious that it's peer reviewed. And so the old guard may give them a hard time if they deviate from a certain line. But we do see more and more people that are looking more coldly at it. And so in some universities, there will be changes. But to have like a massive change, I, I, I don't see the root. Um, at least I mm. failed. My book got more than 10,000 people buying it, even though it's only on Amazon and only direct sale. My podcast has about like 100,000 people plus uh, who listen and things like that. But it's not enough to really shape up the education. Sure. Uh, 1,000 people uh, a year, it's many more, but I do private degree. So. Yeah. And I would say that a few years ago, it wouldn't matter so much because private equity was, after all, only for large institutions and they had specialist people and consultants, biased or not, that would go for it. And therefore, well, th th that's it. But now that it's becoming democratized, now that you can have access to uh, well, many different platforms such as Moonfair. People will be sued. So uh, I've been surprised that already DBs were not sued, but, or they have been a bit here and there, but not much. I think there's going to be lots of lawsuits when people will say like, hold on, this is what you sold me and this is what you told me over the phone and things like that, but that has nothing to do with what I'm receiving. I give you an example, if you want, of this important need for education. I was uh, at a party once, a very fancy once, and there were a few billionaires who were like tech entrepreneurs from Europe and they had made their fortune in tech. And uh, late in, in, in the evening, there is a guy who's like, close to pass out on, on a couch. And then he's telling me like, so what do you do? Like, <laughs> and I say, well, I'm, I'm a professor at University of Oxford. And uh, I said, what's your topic? And so I do private equity. And then he's like, he half wakes up and says like, ah, I, I invest in private equity. I invest a lot of money in private equity. I'm like, so I know he's a tech entrepreneur, right? So I guess he invests some of his savings. And I say, okay, which fund are you invested into? Because I was expecting him to have two free funds, right? The minimum ticket size is still about 1 million. So maybe this guy had about like 5 million private equity, something like that. He says, I invest in all of them, all the top quartile. I have KKR, Blackstone, TPG, Bain Capital. And he gave like a list of 10 names saying like, I have all of them. And I'm like, well, that's impressive that, that an individual is on all of these funds. I, I suppose you did this via a fund of fund. And he says, I don't do funds of funds. I say, okay, so who is the person who has given you what I can only assume was this basket of funds that you were you, you invested into? I, I suppose you had only one guy. You didn't apply to KKR independently, to Blackstone, et cetera, to invest. Who is the person who intermediated each time? And then he said, it's Hamilton Lane. Ah, it's Hamilton Lane. So you gave your capital to Hamilton Lane? Okay, that's good. That's what we call a fund of fund. Very good. You can call it differently, a separate managed account, whatever. Right. It's a fund of fund. All right. Now, so how is it going performance-wise? Oh, it's amazing. The IRR, like, through the roof. I say, okay, that's good. But IRR is not always, like, a very, like, precise measure of performance. So, so uh, what is, like, the multiple of money? When he poses, he's, he doesn't quite know what a multiple of money is. Says like, and I said, like, you must receive like two metrics. I usually like you, you must see like the IR. There is another one which is like TVPI or some MYC, like TVPI usually. He says, oh yeah, this one is amazing. It's a, I have a hundred fifty percent return. Wow, hundred fifty percent return. That's a very high number, and. How long have you been invested in, in these funds? It's like five years. I started five years ago. Okay. And how much money did you give them? And so let's say that you had given them 100. And I say, what is the current value of your portfolio? And it was 150, right? So basically, you had um, 10% a year. And his portfolio went from 100 to 150. And his return 
did you say was 150 percent which is indeed very impressive, except it's 50 percent, except it's over five years, and so it's less than 10 percent a year. And I have seen reports by funds of funds and overs to individual investors where like, they take a multiple like 1.5 times and they write 150 percent instead, which then confuses people. They think it's a rate of return. They think they are doing amazing, but they are just like doing very normal. And so that's a very big problem. Then you could say this guy deserves to be departed from his money, but it, it's very worrying for broader public. Yes, and I'm just sharing a little uh, clip that I just got recently from Tony Robbins, so sort of famous personality, on CNBC, and they quoted him. If you put your millions in the S&P 35 years ago, forget about it. it will, well, the calculations are wrong. I, I checked it myself, but it says 20, 35 years in the S&P, 26 million, the same in private equity, 139 million. And that's something that, well, it's one example. Really sh- I can be sued on this. It's super misleading. Mm-hmm. It's people are playing with fire. No, that, that's my point as well. And I'm going to share a little, because for my sins, I was also a sales in financial markets. And what we were doing back then, we were also, now I call it manipulating data because I'm reformed sales, but uh, we were trying to present whatever we had in the best possible way. And that was our job. And then there were rules that came into place and they were saying, you cannot just do a back test to present the data. You cannot choose any <laughs> of the worst possible benchmark, etc." Basically, there were rules in place. And, and obviously, then we were very careful about those rules. And suddenly, well, we complied and life went on the banks didn't go bankrupt but obviously it became easier for people to have an immediate point of view on what we were doing and i was selling to institutions so i expect that they had the, the skills to go, to see through this and it was not lying right i was not saying it's i i was not calling the returns are irr yeah it's santa claus but even the ir they, 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 when making that comparison it's actually illegal but most of the or the lies are not lies, or they are like this lying by omission, it's in the class type of things. When KKR writes, our since inception return is 23% a year, it, it, they're not lying. It, it's an internal rate of return, and they just shorten internal rate of return by return. So it, it, technically, it's not a lie. It's highly misleading, but it's not a lie. But that's what I'm talking about. So if there's not enough pipeline in the uh, Oxford course, not uh, enough downloads in the podcast, etc., to go through this, is there a call for maybe regulation or, well, we'd like to say self-regulation, but it's unlikely or something like that? All these problems we are talking about, if you would read newspapers, books, etc., from a hundred years ago, were exactly the same in public markets. People in public markets would quote returns that would be like adjusted in all kinds of ways. They would like select their track record. They, they would present performance in all kinds of ways that are misleading. And it's only in the 1930s that then the SEC was created and then started thinking about maybe I should make some rules, some level playing field for how do you present performance, how, what did you allow to say and not allow to say, how do you calculate returns and so on and so forth. We forget that it's just 100 years old, these processes and rules and the like. And the fact that this is done only for public markets is very strange. The idea is that you have a level playing field because people can compare things and then it's fair. And we don't do that for something that has now grown tremendously. It's extremely strange. And the, the battle around regulation in, in, in the U.S. is very interesting. It practically is now the number one lobby in, in, in Washington. It's quite amazing. And the senators receive all kinds of brochures full of IRs and the like. And I heard that argument in Senate where the guy says, but they are selling these things to winning buyers. Therefore, everything must be all right. And we should not legiferate. You could have applied this reasoning to any financial fraud. Bernard Madoff was selling only to winning buyers, right? They, 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 Madoff didn't force anyone, right? So that cannot be a line of reasoning. And yet we hear senators in the US just saying that. And then in Europe, it's even worse. Like in the UK, there's absolutely zero interest in looking into private equity and same for the rest of the world. So it, it is a problem. I think it will change with a few lawsuits. Yeah, I think typically the, we cannot ex- expect the regulators to move ahead of, uh, of the trouble. But typically when there's a crisis, then there's a possibility for something else. There's so much I'd like to talk about that. But um, as we're clo- running close to time, I just wanted to ask something else, which I learned from the book. And I thought it was so 
telling. It's perhaps not the, the most important aspect, but it was a very good window in terms of the complexity of uh, private equity, and it's the fees. So we talk about typically two and 20 fees, right? And people may say it's a lot or it's a lot, not a lot. Anyway, that's what they are. But I realized that, uh, well, it's much more complicated than that when you own the company. So can you tell us a bit more in details about yeah. this issue? The learning point in, in the fees, and that's again one, one thing that in, even if you get a course on private equity in an MBA program or any other program, you will always focus only on what the GP does. At best, you will talk about the performance of the GPs report to the LPs, but that's it. You will never have much discussion around the asset management aspects of it, about the pension funds type of issues, about what kind of limited partnership agreements they find, what are the clauses they have to look af after the, or look at to, the, how fees are computed, etc. There is hardly any MBA student or MSc student that would go through like the calculation of a waterfall in a carry. And so... Even if we take practical education, it's usually tilted only towards like what's happening with companies. So the book goes on quite a bit into the details of this, and it has been extremely difficult to write. And the key learning point from that those chapters is the headline fees uh, is absolutely useless. It doesn't matter if it's two and twenty. You can have a two twenty, but it's much more expensive than a one in ten. This week, I've given an interview to Practical International magazine where I explained that. If you do a pure deal by deal carry and you would even charge us 5%, it would be more expensive than 20% on a European style waterfall at the fund level. And the reason is you could bankrupt like three quarters of your investment and charge 5% on only the winners. And that would represent much more money than if you were charging even 20 or 30% on the anti fund in these sorts of scenarios and many others. So, very often, there are two issues. One is that people don't realize that the headline fees has nothing to do with how much you will end up paying. And two, these headline fees are cited in a way that are completely abstract to people and they don't realize what it means. So if I tell you, you pay 220, there is an 8% hurdle rate, there is an 80% catch up, I can give you more details. That's not going to help. You don't know how expensive this is, right? And if you tell me 220, actually, intuitively, I would have thought this is not very expensive. 2% is a normal fee. And 20% of only what I have earned in excess of a benchmark sounds very reasonable to me, right? So you really need to get into the details of saying, well, yeah, but the 2% is not really the money that has been deployed. And when it has been deployed, it's on like capital that you have committed and so not yet invested. And so already it starts getting a lot more expensive. Ah, wow. Okay. And there is also organizational expenses that you pay like 1% of capital commitment that is like at date zero. And so they buy very quickly, early, and they are large. Ah, okay. And then also when we are outside of the investment period, there is a way to calculate net invested capital that could lead to very high fees or low fees, depending on how things are calculated. All right. But how about the 20%? That didn't sound much. Well, 20% above 8%, but there is a so-called catch-up clause, which basically effectively eliminate the 8% for most funds. And what it means is that then you pay 20% of anything above zero. So if they return 10% of your money, they get 2%. If they return 20% of your money, they get 4%. And if you combine all of these fees, the average fund we are talking about in private equity gets a fee of about 700 basis points. Now, that's a very different number. If I tell you 220, it sounds pretty cool. I tell you this is equivalent of 700 basis points. You're like, what? And I make my students do these calculations. You can see it very quickly, very easily in Excel. You just like put the normal fee structure 220. You do the math on a fund that doubles their money on each investment. And that would be 700 basis points hit on uh, a VIR if you, if you want to use VIR. So you can see that. But how many practitioners is going to come to students and say, here is how a fee structure is working. It's 220, but it means 700 basis points on average for a fund that would return like 12% on average net of all fees. No practitioner is going to go over these kind of calculations and they're like, right, why, why would they? Yet it's very important if you are allocating capital because fees, death, and taxes are the only things that are certain when you're investing money. What is not certain is how much money you're going to make. But if you can control your fees, your death <laughs> or your taxes, then that that part is in your pocket for sure, right? But and and so that's why it's very important to teach to a student. I I would bet that ninety nine percent of the courses in the world that do private equity, there is ninety nine percent of the courses when they didn't say what was the equivalent of a two twenty fee, that that people do not realize first they go do a calculation, mm 
And they don't know how much it means in terms of impact on, on returns. Indeed. Wow, that's really fascinating, Bruno. I want to wrap up because I have that, we have so many more questions. There would be so much, many other myths to debunk as we do it in the book. But I think with those just two examples, returns, fees, we've understood that it's, it's so complex. And look at it from a broader point of view, the educational point of view. Well, I'm glad that you said things are changing. Uh, more academics are coming into play, the, the practice is changing. But I think the uh, big danger for investors is what I would call maybe shallow learning to try to educate yourself and Google a few things and go on the KKR website and yeah. get there, get this and read a few newspaper articles. Uh, well, also follow a course to cert- get a certificate online. I did the P course of Bocconi. I thought it was excellent, but uh, none of this was uh, disclosed there. And therefore, it's a, yeah, it's a really interesting time, especially given that it's at the, it's like Blackson says, the alternative era. We're democratizing it and it's becoming available for everyone, which is why I said at the beginning, I think this is going to be the most important episode for investor. And I'm very glad that you provided all those answers. It was fantastic. Okay. Thank you very much for having me. All the best. And uh, yeah, if people want to be educated, they can go on my website, platebear.com, and there is all kinds of resources there. Yeah, we'll put all the links there. I'll also put an IRR spreadsheet because it's so much easier when you calculate it with a spreadsheet. And I would highly recommend you guys to follow Ludo as well on LinkedIn, where he distills these uh, nuggets of uh, wisdom in very specific posts, which makes it easy to digest. And the book as well, so you'll learn all of that, but it's also easy to read, which is uh, perhaps surprising, but I guarantee you that. Thank you so much, Ludo. All the best. Thank you so much.